Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on macroeconomics. Uh, so, uh, the way this works is that you will keep telling me your doubts on what you have on the topic of macroeconomics or uh, say the Indian economy in general if you want to, if you read something in the newspapers and you want to understand what is the economic uh, implication or significance of what you read. You can ask me those as well. Uh, the thing, it, the way it works is that you would have to have your uh, laptops and computers muted. Uh, I will answer them. You will write the questions uh, on the chat box, and uh, I will answer those questions one by one. So that's how it's going to proceed. Um, so, if you can take take some time and think of some questions, some doubts that you have, uh, and you can write them on the chat box. I will pick them one by one and I will start answering those questions. So please uh, go ahead and write some uh, questions on the chat box so that everybody can see and I can see. Uh, yeah, make the chats uh, open to everyone so that everybody can see the question and I can see the question. I will also repeat that question and answer that question. It does not need to be only related to macroeconomics, as in, but the Indian economy in general, you can also ask questions. Okay, um, I got some feedback. My voice is cracking. Is it clear now? Can you guys uh, hear me properly? Because I got a first question from Radhika and she's asking me what is the meaning of CAGR. Uh, the meaning of CAGR is compounded annual growth rate. Uh, it means, uh, okay, so that if you have to show you what CAGR is, it's very simple. Um, say you have five years. So say you have a starting value today, it's, it is uh, t equals to 0, so, and tomorrow is t equals 1, then 2, then 3, and then 4, and you have 4 years. Say today the value of something is 7,000, after 4 years you see the value is 12,500, then the cumulative annual growth rate is nothing but the uh, cumulative rate, the interest rate at which if you compound the 7,000 in four years, it will become uh, 12,500. So the cumulative annual growth rate is nothing but because we have how many years? One year, two year. So we have, from today we have, let me show you. So this is the first year, this is the second year, this is the third year, and this is the fourth year. After four years, it becomes 12,500. To calculate the cumulative annual growth rate is nothing. It's simply 12,500 divided by uh, so, the rate is, so uh, I should write it down as a formula, but I don't, I cannot use my pen. Um, let's see how do I write it down. Uh, so, it's essentially 7000 multiplied by 1 plus r raised to the power 4. So, if I write it as a formula, it's this 7000 multiplied by 1 within brackets, 1 plus r which R is the cumulative annual growth rate raised to the power 4. This will give me equal to 12,500. And when you solve this equation for R, you will get your cumulative annual growth rate. The rate at which if you compound 7,000 in 4 years, you will get 12,500. So it's a simple, uh, math, it's a simple uh, compound interest term cumulative annual growth rate. I hope that clarifies your question. So, let's see. Mm. Okay, I have quite a few 
any questions? Okay, a lot of questions. So let's see where it where was the last question. Okay, I got this. Mm. Okay, so the next question, I hope my voice is better now because I've been getting a few feedbacks that it's cracking. Is it is it better? Is it, can everybody hear me? Can you just simply type yes if everybody if it's clear for everybody? So I just got address saying yes. Okay. Is it cracking? Is it cracking for anybody? So I'm, I'm continuing. So okay, Radhika, you're facing some trouble with uh, with my voice. Okay. So I guess it's, it's some internet issues at your end. Maybe maybe your uh, internet connection is a bit slow right now. Okay, I'm going to just proceed with it to the next question where uh, Adwet asked me that does in increasing the FII limit in any industry, uh, will it help the GDP of any country? Um, okay, so um, how do I explain this to you in a simple term? GDP is essentially the value of the goods and services uh, that a country produces. Okay? So it's the total value of all the goods and services produced by a country. Now, what FII does is that it brings and okay, to make a country grow, one of the most important things that is required is the flow of capital. The capital needs to flow from those who have excess capital to those who need capital. And any country which has an efficient market, a financial market, which makes capital flow, flow very smoothly, will probably see better growth because it will money will easily flow from those who have uh, capital to those who need capital. If you bring in FII, it gives brings an extra source of uh, the capital to come in. But just because the FII is coming in, does not necessarily mean that the GDP of the country will grow. What is necessary is that once the FII comes in, the ones they invest, they get some profitable returns from those investments. That those the, the industries that they produce and the industries that they invest in uh, are profitable industries in the long run. These industries benefit uh, from the capital coming in. From that sense, yes, it is sort of true that FII coming in does help the economy a lot. Uh, but when FIIs are coming in, do bear in mind that. Uh, they generally take equity ownership. Most of the money which the FIIs bring in is uh, to buy uh, the company rather than providing debt, rather than providing loans to the company, they go ahead and buy the company. So the FIIs come at a cost that many of the Indian companies uh, begin to have more and more foreign ownership and hence their board have representatives from the foreign, foreign institutional investors and sometimes their policies are such that which could sometimes, it's, it's a very rare case, but sometimes marginalize some of the smaller industries, which is the concern that some of these political parties have. But per se, economically, it's been sort of shown that more FII that a country gets, the better uh, the country is in terms of GDP growth, because that extra capital is coming in, that extra investment is coming in, which is making it easier for the companies to expand their businesses, to look for new business ideas, to grow more products, and uh, in a way lift the uh, the economic growth of the country. Okay, so I'll now move to the next question. Uh, okay, Radhika has asked me, how can we choose a SIP in investing? Okay, this uh, question is, is not at all related to economics. This is personal finance. So I will I would advise you to wait till the personal finance lecture where you where you. Uh, get an answer to this question, and I'm not I'm not the person who's into much of personal finance to be honest. Okay, uh, the next question is: Do foreign banks affect any country's GDP or deficit? Um, this is the question is from Edward. So he's asking: Do foreign banks 
uh, affect any country GDP or deficit? Um, well, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a lot of questions in one question. So, if the, if your answer question is, do they affect the GDP of any country? The answer is yes. If they do affect the GDP of, of a particular country, do they affect the deficit? And here by deficit, I'm taking it as the fiscal deficit. Uh, then no, foreign banks do not affect the fiscal deficit of a country directly. Um, so how does a country affect the, how does a foreign bank affect the GDP of a country? So let's say uh, you have a very powerful, very large foreign uh, bank operating uh, in India and they have a very large network, they have lots of customers, they have loans to many organizations, many companies, they have borrowed, they have deposits from lots and lots of Indians. And let's say uh, there's a shock in, in the economy where the, the foreign bank is headquartered. Let's say it's a US bank and there's a huge shock in the economy and this foreign bank is in trouble and this foreign bank might go bankrupt. It might uh, file for bankruptcy. Now, if this happens, there is a ripple effect, there is a domino effect that the Indian economy will face because of the interconnected nature of this foreign bank. So, and, the sh and because so many companies have loans from this foreign bank and so many people have deposits in this foreign bank, uh, this uh, external shock that this foreign bank got in the US will sort of be imported in India because this foreign bank is highly interconnected in India and hence some people will lose their deposits, uh, you know, the company's liabilities, some people, some people uh, will uh, not be paid back and hence they will suffer a shock which will then spill over into the Indian economy and which would evidently have an effect on the Indian GDP. So yes, foreign banks in some way will have an effect as long as it's uh, very interconnected. If it is not extremely interconnected, then the amount of uh, shock that the foreign bank will bring to the Indian government is sort of limited because uh, many of those uh, US banks did have operations in India during the financial crisis, but uh, their operations were very, very tiny, very minuscule compared to the operations of the other Indian banks. And hence, the financial crisis that hit the United States in 2008 did not have too much of an effect on the Indian's GDP. I guess, of course, there was a little bit of a, a post-2008, there was a, a bit of a decrease in the growth of the Indian GDP. Uh, that's probably because of the exports falling and the sentiments falling, and consumption falling down. That was probably one of the reasons why the GDP fell after 2008, rather than the foreign banks actually having an effect on uh, the GDP. As far as deficit concerns, deficit is fiscal deficit, uh, I may add, it's not the current income deficit. Uh, the fiscal deficit is completely in the domain of the uh, government. It is essentially the difference between uh, the amount the government uh, spends uh, and earns in taxes. Generally, many governments, if not most governments, if of large economies, uh, run a deficit. That means each year they spend way more money uh, than they earn by a taxes and the amount, the difference between the amount that they spend and they earn is called the deficit that the government has uh, incurred for that year. Okay, so I'm looking for the next uh, question. So I'm looking for some more, I'm waiting for some more questions. Please uh, provide some more questions on the chat box. Okay, so I have a very good question from Venkat where he's asking, uh, what will be the impact of the US uh, Fed rate hike uh, on the Indian economy? Um, so this has been a concern uh, for the Indian economy for quite some time. Uh, beginning uh, 2014, beginning the year of 2014, uh, that the U.S. might start increasing their rates and hence uh, that might have a, a sort of negative impact on the Indian economy. 
So let me explain why this is uh, why this is the case. Why you would have uh, why there is this uh, per perception that the, there would be a negative impact. Generally, right now the U.S. interest rates are close to zero, are very close to zero, zero less than one. Now, in a period when the interest rates of, of the largest economy in the world is close to zero, we, we generally categorize this period calling loose money or you know, uh, high liquidity. What does that mean? That means it's very easy for people to borrow in the United States and you have a lot of liquidity in the markets. Liquidity in the sense a lot of money in the market because when interest rates are low it's very easy to borrow so it's a lot of money comes out in the market. And because a lot of money comes out in the market, uh, um, so money is like liquid. It, it will always flow wherever you allow it to flow. So the money which came out during this large, this ten years of, or five years, yeah, like around eight or nine years, or even more, yeah, more like ten or twelve years of low interest periods in the United States. This money made it to the stock markets of India, stock markets of China, stock markets of South Africa, of Brazil. Russia and all the other emerging economies in Southeast Asia. Now the fear is that as soon as the interest rates in the U.S. start rising, uh, many of the money will go back because <clears throat> uh, the assumption among financial uh, the financial economists is that the U.S. is an extremely safe country and the uh, lending money to the U.S. government is as risk-free as it can get. And if the country which is the most riskless when it comes to investing, uh, when it comes to lending money, so when you lend money to the U.S. government, it's almost a risky investment because you are, there is absolutely no chance that the U.S. will default on its on its loan. So when you lend money to the U.S., uh, the U.S. Uh, you, you you are going to now once the interest rates start rising, you're going to get a better return on your investments in the U.S. So these financial players in the markets will now see, hey look, why are we investing in extremely risky areas when investing in US can give us a better return by just simply putting money uh, in the uh, US government bonds would give us a better return. So there is this fear that a lot of money will flow back into the flow back to United States. The other thing that the rate hike does is that the rate hike will sort of also attract, will also limit the amount of money flowing in the economy. So as, as the basic economics has it, you cannot, uh, you cannot have, uh, sorry, so as basic economics has it, is that once a central bank starts to raise interest rates, the money supply in the economy starts coming down. And this is another fear that might, that the, uh, Financial economists have that, which might negatively affect, uh, which might negatively affect Indian uh, the emerging market economies. Is that once the U.S. raises interest rates, uh, the money will start flowing back. There will be very little money. The, the money supply will come down, and hence people will start uh, taking back their money from these emerging markets and hence affecting them uh, negatively. So that's the sort of fear. Okay, I'm, I, get, I see that there are a lot of issues with, with regards to uh, my voice. Is it, is it clear? Can, can everybody hear me now? Is it fine? Okay. Okay, can you write some more questions on the chat box? I hope my answers uh, could, um, I could answer the questions that have been asked. If there's anything clear, please uh, write a follow-up question. I'll take that up as, as well.
So I have a question from Venkat, a very nice question, where he's asking me, uh, China recently devalued this, their currency. Uh, do you think India should follow suit? Uh, so the short answer to your question is no, not at all. I don't think India should follow suit uh, because uh, why? What is the biggest reason why India shouldn't do the same thing? The biggest reason is that China is uh, current account surplus country and India is a current account deficit country. What does it mean? It means that the amount that China imports is much lesser than the amount China exports, amount in dollars. And the value of the total amount of goods and services that China imports is much lower than the total value of uh, goods and services they export. And hence, uh, the difference between is called the current account. And because it's plus, because it's exports minus imports, and exports being larger than imports, this value is positive, and it's called current account surplus. So China has a current account surplus. India has a current account deficit. That means the amount that India exports is lower than the amount that India imports, values in, in dollars and goods and services. So India has a deficit. Now when you devalue your currency, Essentially what you do is that you are trying to increase your exports even more. You're making your exports more competitive, but at the cost of making your imports more, ex more expensive. So you're trying to make your, so do you know, I, I hope you guys realize that when you, when the currency of a particular country depreciates, so let's say when the Indian dollar, the Indian rupee to dollar, which is at 65 to the dollar, if it goes from 65 to the dollar to say 75 to the dollar, which is the um, devaluation, uh, Indian exports benefit from it. Why? Because Indian exports can be more competitive in the foreign market. They can price their goods lower and still earn the same or maybe more money. So the devaluation of a currency is very good for exporters but it's very bad for importers because now something if they were buying for one dollar, they were paying 65 Indian rupees to buy that thing. They now have to pay 75 Indian rupees to buy that thing. So keep this basic thing in mind that devaluing a currency is always good for exports but very bad for imports. Now when China is devaluing their currency, essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to boost up their exports even more. Because the GDP of a country, if you go by the formula that's there in the slides that you have, the GDP of a country is equal to the, uh, the consumption plus the investments. Let me see if I have it somewhere here. Yeah, I think I have it here. Wait. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you can see this formula, can everybody see this formula y equal to c plus i? plus G plus MX. So the Y is the GDP of the country. So the GDP of the country is equal to the consumption plus the investment plus the uh, government purchases plus the net exports. Net exports is the exports minus imports. So if you see, if you see this formula, and if you notice that if you increase the net exports, the GDP, the Y increases. So that is essentially what China is trying to do because their economy is sort of stuttering a bit. It's facing some troubles. They probably not will not be able to grow at the rate at which they were growing in the past ten years. So they want to still keep growing at that rate in which they were growing in, in the past ten years, and that's why to give a boost to their GDP, they devalue their currency so that their exports get a hit. And they have they can do that because China imports much less than that they export. So net net they will actually gain from devaluing the currency. But India being a current account deficit country, if India starts devaluing the currency, it will of course benefit from the increased exports, but the amount of suffer they will have to suffer a lot on the import side and because they are importing more, 
net net it will actually decrease their GDP rather than increase their GDP. So this is the answer to your question of why India shouldn't follow suit, why India shouldn't do the same uh, what China did. I think India has a much more robust economy uh, and, and the possibilities of growth in India are much higher. China is sort of face feeling a burnout because they were growing at an extremely fast pace for the last 10 years or so and it was mostly export driven, driven growth. Most of the growth in the GDP came from the exports that China were making. China, in my opinion, should start focusing on the domestic economy now. Maybe their future growth will come from consumption within the country rather than more exports. And that is also something that India should focus on. Try to make sure that most of your growth comes from consumption within your country. So in this formula, this formula is a very simple formula, but it explains a lot. You see that the GDP is, is a summation of essentially four things. You can either increase the consumption or the net exports. There is very little you can increase the GDP by I and G. I is the investment and G is the uh, government, uh, the government purchases. In some cases, you can club the I and C together. Um, so if, you, if the country should focus on endogenous growth as a growth coming from within the country, so try to increase the consumption within the country, People have more money in their hands, they have more expending power, with the more spending power they spend more, they consume, they buy more goods and services and that's how the economy goes. That is probably the better way in which China can grow rather than focusing on the export driven growth, which sort of India is sort of also trying to, uh, uh, trying to mimic that style of growth where they are giving a huge boost to export. In my opinion, uh, focusing on consumption within the country is a better way uh, for a country to go, grow. Okay, so the next question is from Radhika. So what will be the role of people in a country to decrease inflation? Okay, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so Radhika, I don't think there's much that the uh, people uh, in a country can do to decrease inflation. Um, I mean, it, inflation is solely um, an equilibrium concept and uh, the people of this country have very little uh, in their hands to affect this equilibrium. Uh, the only people who can sort of affect this equilibrium is the central bank because they control the most important thing which is related to inflation, that is interest rates. So it's essentially only the only the and of course the uh, the total supply of money in the economy. So because we as just normal people in the in the economy, we are very minuscule given the size of the economy and it can have very little effect on, on the inflation in the country. Uh, it's only the central bank which has the ability to uh, sort of control in, inflation. Uh, in some sense, the other institution which can also have an on inflation is the government but the government's role is extremely uh, extremely small because the government also cannot do much so what the government the government can only do stuff which increase inflation the government can in sort of take steps to not allow inflation to increase but they cannot take steps which cause deflation which cause inflation to come down so uh, but the government, how the government, uh, government spending, so when governments spend a lot of money, that is also sort of uh, raising the demand for, for, for goods and services in the country because the government is a major spender in the economy. And as you know from basic economics, if there's more demand, the prices will rise. So there's a huge amount of government spending that generally leads to a little in, increase in inflation. So from that aspect, the governments do have an effect on inflation, but it's extremely small. So the amount that they can that they impact inflation is extremely small. The only institution which can impact inflation is the uh, central bank, the RBI. They are the sole institution who have complete power with the hands to control inflation. Okay, so I have another question from B.S. Prabhakar and he's asking me 
uh, please differentiate the role of FIIs invited by the PM and the state. So, uh, Prabhakar, in honesty, there is no difference. It's essentially the same thing. In one case, uh, uh, the Prime Minister is uh, inviting FIIs to come forward and invest, and in another case, the Chief Minister of the state is asking FIIs to come and invest. They're essentially the same thing. Only in this case, uh, the, the Chief Minister of any particular state will obviously want the investment to be in companies uh, within their state or will ask the FII institutions. Uh, well, uh, by the way, it's, it's FDI, not FII. FII is which mostly invest in stock markets. It's FDI, that's I guess you're talking about. So they will ask the FDIs to come and uh, grow a plant or open a, a factory or open an industry in their state. The Prime Minister will invite um, uh, FDIs on a national level where they can invest uh, anywhere in the country. They will, so the Prime Minister will then have to uh, you know, talk to the Chief Minister of the state where a particular company wants to set up and then he can liaison and make uh, the, the connection between the state Chief Minister and the FDI that has come in and then uh, facilitate the investment. So essentially both it's the same thing. There's no difference between the role of the FDI invited by the PM or by a CM. So, I have a question from Radhika, and she's asking me to control inflation. What are the actions taken by the central bank? So, it's a very good question. It's a basic question with regards to what central banks do. Um, so, central banks essentially have three, uh, three tools, I could say, uh, which they use to control inflation. Uh, the first is they control the interest rates. So they increase and decrease the interest rates when they want uh, when they want to take out money from the economy when they want to suck out money from the economy they will increase the interest rates increasing the interest rates will reduce the money supply uh, in the in the economy and hence uh, that will sort of have an effect on uh, reducing inflation the next thing they can do is that they can directly control the amount of money supply in the economy, not by interest rates. How do they do that? They do that by buying and selling government bonds. So when they want to suck up money from the economy, take up money from the economy, they can simply start uh, selling government bonds, where they sell government bonds in the open market. And so they sell it, they get back the money, which reduces the total amount of money supply in the the third thing which the central bank does to control sort of inflation is they have these ratios which they ask the banks to observe the SLR and the CR, the credit reserve ratio and the statutory, the statutory liquidity ratio. What these ratios essentially do is that they, they are an indirect way of controlling the amount of money in the economy. In the CRR, the central bank is essentially telling the bank how much they can lend for every hundred rupees of deposit. So if the CRR is 2.1% or 2.2%, they're essentially saying that for every hundred rupees of deposits, the banks can only lend, say, 97.5 rupees. So the 2.5, they have to keep with the RBI. So this is the credit reserve ratio. The higher this ratio, the higher the CRR, the less the banks can lend out to the economy. And that sort of decreases the money supply in the economy. Statutory liquidity ratio is also similar. It's the amount that the banks have to keep in cash and in gold with themselves. So if the statutory liquidity ratio is very high, the banks cannot lend out too much of the cash and they have to keep the cash with themselves. That also sort of decreases the money supply in the economy, which again affects inflation. So these are the three basic ways in which the central bank controls the inflation in the country. The interest rates, uh, the money supply by buying and setting up in bonds, and by the liquidity ratios, the statutory liquidity ratio, and the credit reserve ratio. The RBI had the right to set these. RBI had the right to decide on how much bonds they could buy and sell in the open market. And the RBI has the right to decide on what the interest rates, what the uh, repo rates are going to be. And with these three tools, they control the inflation. So, um, Sanjeev Bhatti has asked you what is the relationship between bond and interest rate. Uh, I'm guessing you're asking what is the relation between the price of a bond and the interest rate. So the relation between the price of a bond and the interest rate is that as soon as the interest rates go up, 
uh, the price of the bond goes down. So how, uh, let me explain this to you in a simple uh, Excel set, set of setting. So if you have a bond which say pays uh, you know uh, hundred in five years, so it's a zero coupon bond which will give you uh, a face value of hundred in five years, and let's say the interest rates right now are I don't know, let's say eight percent or something, uh, then the the value of the bond today is the face value that you get divided by uh, the Uh, sorry, I'm sorry for this. Actually, I have a keyboard in which it's all messed up, so it's very difficult for me to do. Okay, perfect. So we see that uh, when you have a coupon bond, uh, a zero coupon bond, that means if you buy this bond at 68.05 uh, rupees today, after five years you will get 100 rupees, which is essentially a cumulative annual growth rate of 8%. Now let's say the interest rates go up. Okay, so from 8 it goes to 8.5. Well, look at what happened to the price. The price came down because the rate at which you will discount uh, the future cash flow is now higher. And because the rate at which you discount the future cash flow is higher, the price of the bond right now will go down. So there's an inverse relationship between price of bonds and interest rates. Okay, so the next question is uh, from Venkat and he's asking, uh, how do you think India can reduce the fiscal deficit? Oh, that's a very uh, interesting question, and, and it's a tough question to answer because you know if I could really answer that question extremely uh, well, I would probably be working for the finance ministry. Okay, so how can how can India reduce their fiscal deficit? Um, so as you know, the fiscal deficit is essentially the decrease, uh, the difference between the amount the government earns and the amount the government spends, and generally when they spend more. And when they spend more, they have a deficit. Uh, so in, in a given year, if they spend more than they earn, that's a fiscal deficit. Um, and they finance this deficit by borrowing money. And that's why you have uh, you know, government of India bonds uh, in, in the market, because the government is raising money, is uh, borrowing money from its own people and to finance this deficit. Now the question is, what happens if you... so? How can uh, uh, how can the government reduce its deficit? So you can see it's a simple, right? So if you have to reduce the deficit, you you either reduce your spending or you increase the taxes or you increase your revenue. To increase revenue, you have to raise taxes, right? So that's very simple. So there are two ways in which the government can do that: a reduce the amount that they spend, or b raise the amount that they earn. And the way only way they can raise the amount that they earn is taxes. But look at the negative effects of both. If the government reduces its spendings, you see this formula right in front of you. You have the GDP of a country is equal to consumption plus investment plus government purchases of goods and services. Now if you reduce the amount of spending, the G is going down. And if a government significantly reduces its spending, then that has a negative effect on the economic growth of the country. So we have a problem on that side. So you cannot easily reduce the amount that you're spending. But what if now you raise taxes? If you raise taxes, now people have very little money to spend because they are, um, a majority of their money is being taxed. And because the majority of their money is being taxed, they have very little to spend and that's why the C comes down because they are, not, they are now going to spend less in the economy. So if the people now spend less in the economy, the C will come down. The consumption will come down in the equation that you see here. So that again will have a negative effect on the economy. So you see it's a very difficult thing because you, if you do one, it has a negative effect on the economy. If you do the other, it also has a negative effect on the economy. So it's a very difficult balancing act that every government has to play to decide how to control their fiscal deficits. Generally, uh, the governments do not allow the fiscal deficits to go over 4% of GDP. That's sort of very, 
If it's above five percent of GDP, okay, that's a very bad sign for an economy and for a government. You cannot run a fiscal deficit above five percent of GDP. I think India's fiscal deficit somewhere is in the range of a little over three percent of GDP right now, and the target is to keep it under three over the next three or four years. I think that's the target which has been set by the finance ministry. And you see that they they can sort of achieve by increasing taxes a little bit here or maybe you know reducing their spending on certain things that they think that they know don't need to spend. That is how they sort of control this fiscal deficit. So it's a very difficult task that a government has to control the fiscal deficit. They try to achieve it at a small rate. They try to decrease their fiscal deficit at percentages of 0.2 or 0.3. So every budget you will see the finance minister come and say, okay, my target is that I will reduce the fiscal deficit from say 3.6% to 3.4%. So just a 0.2% difference, but that is a huge task for a government. So it's a very difficult task for a government. Okay, so the next question is, uh, we do not have a social security system. The interest rates are getting lean. Please explain. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, I don't understand the link between the two things that you just mentioned. Well, we do not have a social security system. That is true. But we do have a lot of uh, social programs. So, I mean, you know, India is not completely uh, a state where you do not have social security. I mean, uh, I mean, although it is in a very bad shape, but India does provide free education and free health care. I mean, at least in, in theory they, they do because in most states and most uh, in most states uh, education and uh, okay, so in most cases uh, the, the education in the primary institutes in a state is free and so is the health care. Of course, it's a different story that the state of the infrastructure of the public health care and public education is in absolute shambles in the country. So it's incorrect to say that India does not have a social security system. India does have a sort of social security system, but um, uh, it's extremely, it's in extremely bad shape. Um, I do not exactly understand what you mean by when you say the interest rates are getting lean. Can you rephrase that question and then I can probably answer that question. Ah, okay, so you're meaning for senior citizens. Okay, yes, yes, you're right that we, we do not have uh, uh, sort of too much of. Uh, so let me think. Do, does let me think of examples where India does have it. But I think you, in general you're right. India does not have too much of, of uh, too much of uh, money being given out towards uh, senior citizens. Um, yes, that's absolutely right. India does not. Uh, Probably, and this is my intuition speaking rather than my knowledge, uh, probably I think it has got to do a little bit more with the cultural difference uh, between the United States and other uh, European countries and uh, India, where um, in India generally uh, senior citizens or like parents or senior uh, parents, uh, it's, this, the, the, it's their next generation, their sons and daughters who generally take care of uh, 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 take care of their um, of their elderly parents, but that is not the case in in other European Western countries where the state takes a lot of care of the senior citizen. So that's a, that's a sort of a cultural difference. Uh, but as uh, I see, someone has just mentioned that different states have pension amounts for senior citizens. Yes, they do, but the pension is earned by them. So if you have a senior citizen who wasn't working and who does not have a pension, the state just simply you know, does not take care of that guy, person at all. They simply, you know, would want him to die or something. Uh, so yes, you're right in that sense. We, we do not have uh, too much uh, of health care and uh, for uh, senior citizens. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, so write down some more questions. Okay, so a very good question from Menkat. He's asking me, uh, how government determines the amount of currency to be printed released into the system? Okay, so first let me clear a misconception that you have, which I can understand from this question. The government does not do that. The government cannot in any way control the currency to be printed and released in the, into the system. This is completely in the domain of the central bank. It is only and only the central bank which decides of how much money to be printed and released into the system. The government has no influence and no say on this. The government cannot say this at all. This is one of the most important things you need to have in a major economy, that independence of the central bank from the government. The government should not and cannot be able to control the central bank. That is very important. Uh, so how does the central bank decide the amount of money to be released into the system? Uh, the central bank takes into account mostly the inflation of the country. They take a view of what the inflation is, what the inflation will be over the next six months and one year, and based on that, they decide uh, what the money supply should be in the economy. So it's on, it's mostly, primarily based on inflation. Some more questions? Yeah, you're welcome, Michael. Some more questions? Please ask me some more questions, uh, even if it's regarding some things that you're reading on the newspaper, regarding the Indian economy. Please feel free to ask those questions.
Does anybody understand why uh, uh, why the government is asking the Reserve Bank of India to reduce interest rates? Do you have any question on that? So Michael is asking if there has been one reduction of interest rates recently, do I foresee uh, many more with many more before the year end? Uh, that's a that's a difficult question to answer because it's very difficult to say what's going to happen in the future. Um, I think it's it's given the outlook because uh, so there are certain things which sort of uh, suggest that yes, there could be some reduction, and there are certain things that sort of uh, there are sort of things that could uh, decrease the possibilities of a reduction. So for example, uh, pulses in India are right now extremely highly priced. So I think pulses like dal and all that are priced at some, somewhere above 200 uh, rupees a kilogram. Now this is a, a negative uh, input when it comes to decreasing interest rates because the government uh, the government of RBI will, will take into account this and then probably um, anticipate what the inflation is going to be in the near future. So if there are signs that there could be increased prices of, of food commodities, then, then I don't think there will be any more cuts this year. But if, if I think, if, but if the prices of foods are sort of contained, uh, pulses are sort of brought down, uh, and uh, uh, and you know the oil prices tend to remain, continue to remain low, then possibly yes, there will be another rate cut this uh, this year. But given the prices of uh, of food items, it's sort of uh, uh, it, it's it's difficult given the the amount. The pulses are being priced right now in India. Some more questions? So the question from Venkar is that do I think that the PM's Jandhan Yojana will contribute to the national economy? Um, okay, this is also a difficult question to answer. Uh, so if I look at what the what the uh, scheme is, is essentially trying to open bank accounts for many, many, many uh, Indians and try to bring them into the, into the financial system. Um, so yes, so I think it's a good idea to include, to include, to bring many, many of the rural people uh, and poor people into the banking system, giving them bank accounts. Uh, and, and, and making them part of the financial system, I think that's a, that's an extremely uh, well good idea. Um, but how beneficial will it be for the economy is is, is uh, a question of what happens after they have the bank accounts. So will they have access to easy capital? Can they borrow money from these banks without any collateral, without mortgage? Uh, you know. Uh, so this, that's the biggest thing. So just giving somebody a bank account will not will probably have no effect on the economy. It's 
the idea is that they would be brought inside the financial system. And once they had wins, they are inside the financial system, they would have access to capital, which is the key element of this. So they should have access to capital. They can borrow money. If it is so that via the scheme they get access to capital, then yes, that would be very, very extremely beneficial for the economy. But if it is so that the scheme is only leading to people opening bank accounts, and most people have bank accounts with zero balance, then probably it will not have any effect on the economy. So it's always a bit, it's extremely crucial of what happens next. How are these people who have bank accounts, how do they benefit? Do they get access to capital, yes or no? And that's the crucial question. If they get easy access to capital, if they can borrow money from these banks, then yes, it will definitely be beneficial for the company. Okay, so I have another question. So, from America, do you think India has lost much by Pakistan not declaring FMFN uh, status while India has given Pakistan MFN status? Okay, so I, no, I think I don't know the details of the most favored nation status. So, I am currently unequipped of what benefits does uh, one get from uh, India and Pakistan being most favored nations. I think it's, it has got something to do with taxes. Uh, so if okay, so I, I'm going to try and answer this question from the perspective of of trade between India and Pakistan. Uh, so let's let's take a look at how much of how much of uh, exports uh, uh, can we make to Pakistan, and how much of the imports can we get? I mean, I do, I do not know the figures honestly of what is the uh, import net import and exports of trade with Pakistan. Uh, um, so I think it, I, if you ask me that has India lost a lot by in terms of trade agreements with Pakistan? I don't think I think it's it's marginal the amount that India's economy has suffered because of trade agreements with Pakistan because Pakistan is is a much is a much smaller economy than India. Well, it's a, by far an extremely small economy compared to uh, India. So I'm not sure that India would have lost too much in terms of trade agreements uh, given what you just written with regards to most favored nation status. Um, so the short answer to your long question is probably no, they haven't. So Prabhakar was asking me why credit cards which, which make people debtors are encouraged in the present day scenario. Mm, okay, so. Um, it's a, it's okay. The way it's encouraged is that it, it's a sort of a product which the banks have created. And this product is something which has found demand. People want credit cards because they want to buy before they have the money and then pay later. Of course, there is the ugly side to it that many people end up not being able to pay. They buy too much and they end up being debtors and doubtful debtors and they do not end up Pay. So I think it's a cultural thing. Uh, I think credit cards are used in more urbanized and more westernized economy where people, uh, you know, sort of tend to spend before they earn. But in more rural and more non-urbanized or semi-urbanized areas, people try to save first and then spend later. I think it's a simple uh, question of a product being created by the banks and the product is liked by the customers 
and hence the customers buy it. So it's not a question of encouraging or discouraging it. It's a product that has been created by the banks and the, this product is in, in demand. There are many people wanting to buy, get this product. I mean, but although I, I should also mention something. Uh, so I think the idea that you're touching upon, so the question is very specific, but the idea that you're touching upon is, uh, is credit-driven consumption a good idea? And there I, I will sort of agree with the idea that you're putting forward, that yes, credit-driven consumption is an extremely dangerous thing. I mean, what happened in the United States was sort of, but it wasn't exactly because of credit consumption, but a lot of troubles were because there was too much reliance on debt for, uh, for a lot of things. And when consumption in an economy, when people are buying more and more, and this is consumption is driven by debt, then there's always, there's all, always this uh, danger that there might be too much of debt in the system. So there I sort of agree with you that consumption driven debt is a very dangerous idea for any economy. Some more questions? Please ask some more questions if you have them. So if, uh, if there are no more questions, then we can end this webinar. So uh, if that is okay, if you have any questions, uh, please write down right now. Otherwise, if it is agreeable to everybody, then we can end this webinar. So, would you like to end this webinar? Yes, most welcome, Venkat. Anybody with any question, please, you have your chance right now. Otherwise, um, we can end this webinar. I'm waiting for uh, some replies on the chat. Most welcome, Radhika. Yes, Adver, thank you. Most welcome, Prabhakar. Okay, I will then end this webinar. Thank you everybody for, for joining and 